Thanks for coming. Um, great turnout. There are seats up front. Don't be shy. He's a nice guy. I've already talked to him, so you can sit next to him. It's good. <laughs> so yeah, it's great to see a, a nice turnout. I, I did a talk a few years ago at a resort, and it was beautiful outside, and there's all these great things going on, and I come to talk, and there's like 12 people, and as the talk went on, there was four, and three, and two, and I finally get to the last slide of my lecture, and there's one guy in the audience, and I went up and I shook his hand. I was like, you know, thank you so much for sticking through my lecture. I, I want to take you and buy you a beer. And he said, you know, I'd love to. He says, but I'm the next speaker. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, um, my career as a stand-up had just ended. Um, so I'm going to talk about sleep. Um, you know, I always like to talk about what interested me in sleep. And, you know, it's a very dynamic field. There's a lot changing. And there's a lot more to sleep than most people even consider or even know of. Um, there's probably a lot more than I don't even know about. But what's interesting and fun about it is, you know, we go through our lives and you see your doctor and you treat your hypertension or your diabetes or your rash or whatever. And yeah, I feel a little better or maybe I have less chance of having a stroke. But if you can fix a sleep problem, it's one of the few things I've ever found that can actually really change somebody's life. And, and I hear that from my patients. This changed my life. And that's what's fun and that keeps my passion going and that's why, that's why I'm here to share all this with you. So we're going to talk about a lot of topics, you know, I'm not going to get really in depth in a lot of them because I want to kind of get a lot of information in. I'm um, going to talk about normal sleep, um, some sleep patterns, some sleep stages. Uh, what happens when you don't get good sleep? Why don't you get good sleep? How can we fix those things? And, uh, you know, I like it to be interactive, so if there's an interesting question you want to jump in, just put your hand up. Um, and then, of course, for longer questions or more personal questions, I'm, I'm around after the talk and we can address those as well. So why is sleep important? It's easier to identify why it's important by what happens when you don't have it. And that, this is a partial list. I mean, there's stroke, and there's learning problems, and there's mood problems. We know it's a risk factor for Alzheimer's and dementia. And as America gets older, this is a bigger and bigger issue. Uh, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, learning disabilities, uh, um, accidents. It just goes on and on and on. And so you know, the bottom line is without adequate sleep, we get fat, stupid, and sick. So we got to get you guys good sleep. What happened? I was just talking about how important sleep was. Well, this is actually a quote from a, a very famous American that in one way or another probably changed all of our lives. Any guess who that might be? Ah, you guys got the clue. That's good. Really, yeah. Light bulb, yeah. Yeah, and, and he probably did more bad things for sleep than any other person in history by inventing that thing. All right, because in the old days, back in the agrarian days before the Industrial Revolution, we were just like the animals. When the light came on, we got up, and when the light went down, we went to bed. And now, we're a 24-hour society, we got all these lights, we go and we go and we go. Sleep is kind of an optional thing. But by the way, even though I admire what he did for us, I don't agree with him. This is a very common question. How much sleep do I need? Well, like most questions, the answer is it depends. Depends on how old you are. So babies, anybody's ever had a baby or child, they sleep a lot, up to 18 hours a day. As you get older, a little less preschool, um, school age children, 10 hours, teens, nine to 10 hours. And this is a really important factor and thankfully this is being more recognized. Kids have a different, or teenagers have a different sleep pattern than we do, adults. They wanna go to bed, midnight, one, but they still need their nine or 10 hours of sleep. So what's that get them to? Nine or 10 in the morning, what time are we getting them out of bed to go to school? Much, much earlier. It's like asking you to get up and go to work at four in the morning. You could do it, but you're not gonna be on your game. And it's really a difficult issue. You can say, well, we should just have the kids start later, but of course, that doesn't synchronize very well with parents' schedules and getting places and getting to work and teacher schedules. So it's, it's really, really a big issue. Adults, seven, oops, I dropped one. Adults, seven to nine hours a day. This is what we had told people for years and years, and we really didn't have any data to support that. It's because, well, that's what I sleep, so that must be about right. Well, it turns out, about three years ago, they had this big consensus conference in Madrid where all these sleep scientists and specialists got together to really look at the science we have and decide how much sleep do we really need. So after four days in Madrid and lots of good food and probably some wine and et cetera, et cetera, they came out and said, yep, you need between seven and nine hours, and gave everybody a little bit of a chuckle, but at least now we have some science to support it. By the way, most Americans get far less than the average of seven hours per night. 
So what's normal sleep look like? Again, it's not just closing your eyes and waking up later. There's a lot of things that happen in sleep. There's essentially five stages. Stage one, you're just kind of drifting off. Stage two, you're getting a little deeper sleep. These are lighter stages of sleep, and if you ask people in these stages, often they'll say, no, I was awake. Whereas in the sleep lab, we actually qualify this as sleep, and there's always this discrepancy. Oh, I slept three hours in the sleep lab. Well, actually, you slept six. Because these lighter stages of sleep are kind of that border zone where you may actually have some perception. Then we get in the deeper stages, three and four. These are really important stages. This is what rebuilds our body. This is to help to recover from the stress of the day. We repair, we rebuild, we store, we create more energy, we store glycogen in our liver. All this stuff is happening. So guess what? If you don't get sleep, that stuff doesn't happen. And then REM sleep is a very interesting stage of sleep. It has a lot of characteristics to it that are they're almost kind of bizarre, where we will completely lose muscle tone. And if you look at the brainwave activity of the stage of sleep, it looks very, very similar to the brainwave activity of wakefulness. And there's a lot of similarities what's going on in the brain between REM sleep and wakefulness. It's also where we have those dreams, those wild, crazy, vivid, whatever dreams. You wake up going, whoa, you wouldn't believe this crazy dream I had. Why is that? Well, as you can see, REM starts about every 90 minutes, but as we get towards the early morning hours, it gets more and more prevalent and more and more intense. Again, if you're cutting off your sleep, so imagine you're only sleeping five hours instead of the seven or eight you need, what are you missing a lot of? This is a very important stage of sleep for consolidating memory, for learning. During the day, we get all this input, all this information. At night, this is where the brain consolidates it, commits it to memory, puts it on your hard drive, if you will. And again, if people are depriving themselves of that, they're losing that, and that's where the forgetfulness and the moodiness and all that comes from. Maybe not be big enough for you folks in the back to see. But essentially, it just relates how our sleep stages change as we get older. Again, infancy, we're spending more than half the day asleep and a whole bunch of it in REM. And then maturity, I guess that's adulthood. Um, far more awake, far less um, REM sleep, and a little bit less the deep sleep. And then when you get into old age, you see all those hash marks in there? We still need the same amount of sleep when we get into our 80s and 90s and beyond. It's just a lot more fragmented, and there's all these other factors that are inter interfering with our ability to do it. You know, we get medical issues, we get you know, arthritis, we can't lay on our left side because it hurts, can't lay on our right side. So sleep in the elderly is very, very challenging, and again, it's just as important. There's a myth out there, oh, older people don't need as much sleep. Not true, it's just harder for them to get it. So what's basketball have to do with sleep? Well, I like this slide because, what, does anybody know who the guy in blue is? Steph Curry. Steph Curry, right. Okay, so he's pretty good at what he does, right? Did he get there by hard work? Sure. But he also had some natural talents. He had some gifts, okay? On the right, Will Ferrell, all right? <laughs> he's doing his free throw underhand. Why is that? Because Will Ferrell does not have the same innate talents Steph Curry does. And I've tried to explain this to people, and they say, you know, my, my husband just like, he sleeps like a rock. He lays down, he sleeps, he wakes up, he feels great. And I don't. And I say, well... You know, we all have differing, you know, capabilities and different talents and different things we're good at. And this is really important to think, keep in mind when you try to decide what is my normal sleep. Because what's normal for one person may not be normal for you. And what Steph Curry can do maybe isn't what Will Ferrell can do. Insomnia. Huge problem. And I'll show you some stats on that really quick. Um, Insomnia isn't really a disorder or a disease, it's a symptom. It's a symptom of something else. Why aren't you sleeping? And the list is very, very long, as you'll see. And it's not even the same complaint. So some folks say, oh, I really have trouble falling asleep. Or, you know, I, I get to sleep just fine, but then I'm up and I toss and turn. Or, you know, I sleep pretty good, but I just never really feel like I sleep very well. Everybody has sleep insomnia sometimes. But when it's associated with distress and impaired function, that's usually when it comes to our attention. Very common. Most in common sleep complaint, that's pretty easy to appreciate. Um, other weird things, narcolepsy, those are one in 20 to 30,000. Most people at some point in their life are going to have some insomnia at some point, and it's usually transient. 30 or 40% of the people, right? That's a lot. Distress or impairment, 8 to 19%, that's still a whole bunch of people, right? And it's more common in women as well, about one and a half times. Why is that? You know, there's, there's obviously maybe thankfully, a lot of differences between men and women. There are hormonal things, there are biologic things, there are structural things, there's emotional things. But I think this next slide really explains it much better.
I mean, that's usually my explanation. <laughs> Women just have more knobs and stuff. <laughs> and they understand because men don't have that, they keep looking for the other knobs, and it's like, we, we only got one. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens if you're not sleeping well? Well, again, it's a manifestation of all that stuff we talked about. When you're not sleeping well, nothing's working. Fatigue, sluggishness, sleepiness, somatic complaints, I don't feel good, this hurts, that hurts, nothing's good. Stressing about it, because the less you sleep, the more you stress about it, and that can feed on itself. Mood disturbances, you get grumpy, you get depressed, poor concentration, and of course this lady is probably not uh, functioning at her highest level of performance. But what's interesting, this is so prevalent, it's out there everywhere, it has such just incredible bad manifestations, when patients go to their doctors, they don't talk about it, right? So these are chronic insomniacs. I mean, this is, this is actually a scientific study that was done. I didn't make this stuff up. Never discuss with their physicians. Okay, this is this major thing influencing every aspect of their life. They never even bring it up. Or they bring it up during an office visit for 12 other things. Well, I got this, 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 and by the way, I don't sleep. I always call it the doorknob question. Like, doctor's ready to leave the exam room. He's got his hand on the doorknob. Oh, and by the way, I'm not sleeping well. well what's that hap what happens with that? Sleeping pills. It's real quick. Okay, here, here's some Ambien, right? And that's why up to 10% of Americans take a sleeping pill every single night. And there's consequences to that. And that's why we try to identify what's going on. But again, specifically visiting to discuss a sleep problem, 5%. Why would I need a whole office visit to talk about my sleep? Come on, I'm not sleeping. Give me something, right? Well, it's complicated. It's really complicated. And it takes sometimes more than an office visit to get to the bottom of it. You, know, you have acute stressors, something that happens in your life makes you not sleep, medication, substance abuse that people don't like to talk about can influence sleep, circadian factors, that day-night cycle that we should all be entrained to, and nowadays, thanks to Thomas Edison, we're not. Um, medical issues, neurologic issues, psychiatric disorders are very, very strongly associated with sleep disorders, and vice versa. Sleep disorders can create psychiatric issues. Behavioral factors, people that don't do good things to maintain good sleep, Age, as we talked about, much harder to sleep well as you get older. And then primary sleep pathology, which is one of the things that I, I identify. Things like restless leg syndrome, sleep apnea, which we'll talk about in detail in a little while. This is the most common type, and it's called psychophysiologic insomnia. Why is it called that? Because doctors like big words, it makes us feel smart. But essentially what happens is you get this whatever happens and you can't fall asleep, whether it's you know, poor sleep hygiene or something in your life, and then you get there and like, oh my God, here we go again, I'm not gonna sleep. That self-perpetuates. Then you get mad, you get angry, you get frustrated. Well, who can sleep when they're mad and angry and frustrated? Nobody, right? So then you start doing things to try to help you fall, fall asleep. I'll distract myself, I'll get on Facebook or whatever, turn on the TV, start counting sheep, stare at the clock, and that stuff just kind of perpetuates the whole process. And this is one of the more common types of insomnia that we see. It's also one of the most difficult to fix because, again, it doesn't take a drug. It takes behavioral change. Sometimes I've got to put my psychologist hat on, spend a lot of time hand-holding and explaining and reassuring that your mechanisms for sleep work. You're just screwing them up, and we've got to fix that. So this is a very interesting slide. This is a study that was done, gosh, about 25 years ago. Um, they looked at them, and, and I've never really figured out the timeline on the bottom, so just imagine this is a 24-hour period. Um, but what they looked at was VO2. Essentially, this is metabolism. So the upper line are insomniacs. Their metabolism is higher during every point of the day compared to the lower line. So the lower line is probably Steph Curry, right, and the upper line is probably Will Ferrell. So there are some physiologic differences. It's not just, quote, unquote, all in your head. There's something going on there. And even though this study was done over 20 years ago, we still haven't identified that. And if we could, that would be a big breakthrough. So if anybody wants like a Nobel Prize, figure this out and call me. So how does it happen? So this yellow line here is the insomnia threshold. So below that, we're sleeping great. Above that, we're not sleeping so good. So most of us live below that threshold. Something happens, a life stress or something else, a medical issue, a medication. There's all sorts of different things, as we talked about because it's complicated, and you don't sleep. Usually that stuff resolves, and then you go back to sleeping at like your baseline. What happens in chronic insomnia, again, those perpetuating factors. God, now bed is a battle. I'm gonna get in there, I'm gonna try to sleep, and I'm gonna win this, and then, but who falls asleep while they're fighting, right? 
And so a lot of what I do is psychology and try to get people away from this. And we use a variety of, of uh, tools to help people get out of that kind of mindset of fighting sleep. And I'll show you some of those in a little while. So the management of insomnia, this is, this is kind of more of a, a slide for, for doctors, but it applies to the public as well. You know, how, how do we deal with this? Well, the first thing I do is, is go through that thing, that complicated list of things that can interfere with sleep. And then depending on what you find, you have to address the issue. Why is the referral to sleep specialist at the bottom? There's not enough of them out there, and this should really be something that primary care docs are very good at. Because again, remember, up to 40% of the population has this issue. There's not that many sleep doctors. Um, so hopefully most of the primary care docs are educating themselves on this stuff. And when they just run into a wall and the patient runs in a wall, that's where somebody who specializes in sleep might come in handy. Or if they identify some primary sleep disorder like narcolepsy or sleep apnea, restless legs, et cetera. But that's kind of the overview of what we do. How we figured out. How long has this been going on? How did it start? Do you have symptoms of a primary sleep disorder like sleep apnea? How much does it affect you during the day? It's very interesting that chronic insomniacs, people that really never sleep well, interestingly, they tend not to be very tired. It's, I've, I've always been fascinated by that. Oh, yeah, I slept you know, four or five hours a night for 20 years. But they function, they go to their job, they don't fall asleep at the wheel. Whereas people with primary sleep disorders, sleep apnea, et cetera, those folks tend to be pretty sleepy. And so that's one of the things that can help thresh that out, what's going on. Sleep habits, super important. What's your sleep log? Oh, yeah, sometimes you go to bed at 1, sometimes 2, sometimes you go to bed at 8, sometimes you get up at 3. You know, again, it's a circadian rhythm. Remember that day-night cycle, the animal, right? We're the animals. We follow the light. And if you don't follow the light, then your sleep doesn't follow you very well either. Medications, um, medical issues, psychiatric issues, health habits, you know, alcohol. I'm going to have a nightcap, right? Helps me fall asleep. Alcohol's terrible for sleep. Terrible. It pushes you into this light, kind of disrupted stage of sleep. Sure, you fall asleep easily, but then you never get anywhere. It's like getting on the train in the station. You run to get there and you get on the train, and then it doesn't go anywhere. So alcohol, just pff, forget it. It's not good for sleep. And like I said, it's complicated. It takes a lot of work and a lot of threshing. Most people just want to get a pill and get it fixed and get on to the next stage of their life. So you laugh, but I mean, how, how many people have done this, right? You take your iPad to bed, you take your phone, you take Facebook, you got a 40-inch TV in your bedroom, right? It's terrible stuff. And you're on the phone, and you're working. So in your subconscious, the bed is becoming a place to do all those things. Oh, we're going to bed. Okay, I got to get my man going because we got stuff to do here. Bed is not for all this stuff. And if you want to do this stuff in bed, super, but you're not going to sleep. What is bed really for? <laughs> You're already laughing, you guys know. You, did you, did you, I did this lecture a couple years ago. Were you guys there? All right, two things, all right? That, right, sleep, that's good, huh? All right. So try to find something on the internet with like two people in bed, like, you know, being intimate, and put that on the internet in a Google browser and see what you get. It was astonishing. So, but I did, I did find one that's, that's, that's okay for pu public viewing. The rest of them were just like, really? People do that? It's kind of crazy. But, but seriously, you got to get this in your brain. Again, people say, you know, I get on Facebook every night, and I have corn chips in bed, and I have a beer before bed. And it's like, how do you sleep, Bob? Well, I sleep great. You tired or anything? No, I feel good. OK, fine, do it. This is more for people who are having trouble, right? How do we treat this? Well, there, there's, there's really three components of it. First is the non-pharmacologic, and that should be the first step in 90 plus percent of people. Don't just go for the Ambien. Ambien's evil. Pharmacologic, it does have a role for certain people in certain situations. And sometimes it even combines, like, OK, well, you know, Mrs. Smith, we're going to give you Ambien for three weeks just to kind of reinforce to your brain, hey, I can sleep, just to get you back in that cycle, to remind you that your brain can sleep to get comfortable with that concept, but we're going to work on these other things while we do that because this is not a long-term thing. It's interesting, you know, Ambien, I'm sure everybody knows what that is. Um, when it was first um, approved by the FDA, the drug company submitted it for as-needed use. Like, oh yeah, I have a bad week or a bad night or I have a you know, big day tomorrow and I need to get a good night's sleep. That's what the FDA approved it for. It was never studied. It was never approved for chronic nighttime use. And I have patients who have been taking it for 20 years. And there's, there's consequences with that. But we, and now we're just starting to understand them. In 20 years of this, now we're understanding increasing risk of dementia, Alzheimer's, functional deficits, and, and psychologic addiction. I had a patient 
who came to see me, who was, and it's a true story, he was taking 30 Ambien a night. Oh. Every night, yeah. And, and, and unfortunately he had access to it. He unfortunately happened to be a physician, so he had ways of getting these things. And, um, and, uh, and, he, and he died, he drove his car into a tree. And they said he had a heart attack, which you know, I don't think he had a heart attack. He was 40 years old. So you can bring out these guys, right? This is what everybody does, right? Who, who has not ever, ever, ever laid there and counted sheep? We all have. We all have. Why did we pick sheep? Why isn't it cows? Why isn't it pigeons? Why isn't it seagulls? You know? It's sheep, right? Yeah, so, so these are some sleep consultants that I saw when I was in New Zealand. And uh, I thanked all of them because they were busy making ni nice merino wool that we all like in the wintertime. So these are our non-pharmacologic uh, treatments for sleep. Sleep hygiene I'm going to talk about, so we'll kind of skip over that one. Which, by the way, that is the most important one. Um, stimulus control is exceedingly important. Remember the person in bed with the phone and the pen and the paper and the computer? That's the stimulus. Bed is not a place to be stimulated. It's a place to rest. That's the first place we start. Sounds easy. Habits are really hard to break. And we have these <clears throat> periodic, like, okay, no cell phone for a day things, and people just freak out, right? So now tell them you can't do it for the rest of your life in bed. It's a really, really hard change to make. Sleep restriction, that's kind of an evil thing that I do only when I'm in a bad mood. Um, it, it comes down to like, gosh, Barbie, you sleep, you're in bed 10 hours, but you only sleep four. Why are you spending 10 hours in bed? So we need to increase your sleep efficiency. So what we'll tell her is, okay, well, you only get six hours in bed, and that's it, because the time in bed should be time of sleep. And it's a very, very difficult thing for patients to do. It takes a lot of discipline, but I can tell you it works. It really does work. And I, and I do this with some of my patients who I, I kind of assess them for motivation first. If they just look at me and roll their eyes, we don't go there because it's not going to work. Cognitive therapy, wonderful stuff. There's a thing called cognitive behavioral therapy. There's actually a psychologist in Reno that I work with that specializes in this. This is to kind of get rid of those self-defeating things in your brain. Oh, I can't sleep. I'm never going to sleep. No, you can sleep, and this is how you're going to do it, is address stresses, address fears, address things that are keeping them from actually sleeping well. Um, and it's very, very effective. The problem is insurance doesn't pay for it. They'd rather pay for Ambien. And it takes time and effort. You've got to go see her. You've got to go see her once a month. She gives you tasks. She gives you sleep logs. She gives you diaries. Um, but that's the kind of work that really pays off. And of course, circadian rhythm entrainment, that's, that's relatively unusual. There are people out there who naturally are larks and naturally light, night owls. You know, some people at bedtime, 8 o'clock, I'm down, but they're up at 4 in the morning. Or, hey, I'm not in bed till 2 in the morning, but I got to sleep till 10. It's very hard to fix those. You can in a highly motivated patient. Usually what I tell them, especially the night owls, they say, hey, get a swing shift job. You'll be golden. You'll love it. So what about sleep hygiene? So sleep hygiene is the cornerstone of treating sleep disorders that are, that are non like sleep apnea and that sort of thing. It's just like dental hygiene, right? If you take good care of your teeth and you floss, you brush, you get them clean, your teeth are healthy, they work, it's all good. Sleep hygiene is exactly the same thing. You've got to maintain these things to maintain good sleep. Regularizing bed and wake times, that variable cycle, well, I go to bed when I can and get up when I can. That ain't going to work very well if you want to sleep well. So going to bed at the same time and up the same time. And it's different for everybody. It's not like, oh, you should all be in bed at 10. You know, some people go to bed at 9. Some people go at 11. But you want to get that seven hours or more. Because it's not from the time you hit the pillow to the time you get up, because it takes you a little while to fall asleep. So typically, I advise at least eight hours of sleep time in bed. Stimulate, stimulating behavior. We talked about that at length. It's a huge problem, especially in the electronic error. It's also interesting that if you look at this thing called blue light, many people have heard that. So electronic um, devices put out a lot of this stuff. Blue light impairs the secretion of melatonin from this area in our brain. Melatonin is what tells our brains to go to sleep. So essentially, when you're exposed to blue light, when you got your iPad or your phone or your computer, you're turning off your melatonin. You're turning off your own sleeping pill. If you look at the spectrum, why is this suddenly a new problem? Back in the days when people read light by candlelight, like did Abraham Lincoln not fall asleep well because he's reading by candlelight? Candlelight has very, very little blue light. Some of the manufacturers now are coming out with like blue light filters. I have no idea if they work or not. But again, I think it's a band-aid. Let's get rid of these things, not like try to put a filter on them and get le less, less blue light. Relaxing bedtime routine. You can't go 100 miles an hour, jump in bed, and fall asleep. You get all your tasks done. You make your list. You take care of all tomorrow's tasks well before bedtime. 
dim the lights, read a book with a dim light, just kind of have a relaxing routine to kind of ease yourself in bed. And do this out of bed, because again, remember the two things bed were for, right? You guys remember that. What else is important? Limit daytime naps, right? If you're sleeping well, I sleep great, I have no problem, but I like to take a nap on Saturday, fine, take a nap on Saturday. If you're having a lot of difficulty at night, oh God, I, I gotta catch up, I'm gonna take a two hour nap in the afternoon, then your brain's confused. It's like, wait, is daytime for sleep and nighttime for awake now? So you really wanna limit those naps if you're having trouble sleeping. Conducive sleep environments, you know, quiet, temperature controlled. That's a difficult issue because there's not, I don't think there's a married couple out there that like the same bedroom temperature. If, if you know one, let me know. I'd like to talk to them, right? It's too hot. It's too cold. There's ways of working around that. You know, they make electric blankets now that have different sides and all that. So you can work around those issues. Um, alcohol and caffeine, we talked about it. Alcohol is terrible for sleep. Don't do it. Say, oh, yeah, I have a latte in the afternoon. That shouldn't be fine. I mean, it's gone. It's not. Some people are very sensitive to caffeine. Some people that metabolize it slowly, it'll stick around for 8, 12, even 24 hours. So just look at that. And I always encourage people, you know, get up, have your cup of coffee in the morning, be done with it. Needless to say, monsters, Red Bulls, rock stars, evil, evil, evil. I mean, the, these things should be taken off the market. They're so horrible. People that get it, you can actually get psychologically addicted to these. They create seizures. I mean, they're just horrible, horrible things. Um, which, by the way, I'm now never going to be sponsored by Red Bull. But, <laughs> but stay away from them. Exercise is vital. Exercise is so good for actually everything in our lives and especially sleep. Do you want to get on the treadmill right before you go to bed? No, obviously, earlier in the day, but it really does help. It doesn't even have to be every day. The effects of regular exercise, even three times a week of cardio, really influences sleep in a positive way. So it doesn't have to be every single day. Clock watching, horrible, right? It's 3 a.m., I'm awake, oh great. 3.15, oh super, awesome. 3.30, oh my God. Get rid of the clock. I need to get up, put it in the drawer, Turn on the alarm, don't look at it, because again, this is negative reinforcement. We want positive reinforcement. More negative reinforcement, more negative things that happen. Electronic tasks, we talked about that. Get it done, like right after dinner, sit down, do whatever you need to do, and then put it away. If you have bad sleep hygiene, what do you get? You get bad sleep. And if you have bad dental hygiene, you get bad teeth. That's just to get everybody awake again. <laughs> you go, ew. I couldn't be a dentist. I just wouldn't want to do that all day. So do we ever use drugs? Absolutely use drugs, and they do have a place. Um, acute stress, you know, death of a loved one, chronic insomnia. There are some people out there who are even worse at basketball than Will Ferrell, and they're doing absolutely everything right. Their sleep mechanism doesn't work, right? And we do everything. They are just these people that actually need to be on long-term sleep medicines, but they are this much of insomniacs. I have a few of these people in my practice. You say, well, didn't you just tell us it could cause dementia and Alzheimer's? And what are you doing to these people? Well, interestingly, chronic sleep deprivation, what does it cause? Alzheimer's. Right. So you're, you're, you're kind of stuck, right? So do you want to be demented with no sleep? You want to at least get some sleep and then get demented. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, th these are, these are the things, you know, my colleagues come and say, you say people shouldn't be on Ambien for the rest of their life, and you got Bob here on Ambien all the time. It's like, well, there's exceptions to every rule. And then, of course, you know, um, shift work, jet lag, et cetera, short-term use is actually appropriate. This is a um, picture from an ad that came out 10, 15 years ago uh, for a drug called Lunesta. I don't know if you guys remember seeing this on TV. I love this from a marketing standpoint. This is awesome marketing. Look at her. She's like laying there. She's all happy. She's got a little Mona Lisa smile. There's butterflies around her head. <laughs> And what they're doing is they're making you think, this is normal sleep. This is what sleep should be, right? And if I'm not sleeping that way, then I need Lunesta. This was great marketing. But normal sleep is not this. Normal sleep is disrupted. Normal sleep is waking up a few times, tossing and turning. Normal sleep is having some bad nights, but not getting thrown off by them. God, I had a horrible night's sleep tonight last night. OK, well, I'm going to stay awake and I'll have a good night's sleep tonight. This is not normal sleep, and so you have to have reasonable expectations of, of what happens, especially as we get older. A lot of things get harder as we get older. Sleep's one of them. Medications. Mind you, this is a partial list, right? It's a partial list. There's all sorts of different things. Um, the top line, benzodiazepines, this is in the um, class of, of Valium, et cetera. These used to be the go-to drugs. They have a lot of side effects. They, are, uh, they develop tolerance. You can develop hab habituation. You can develop addiction. They don't play well with others because now you know, half the country is on narcotics. The combination of the two of those is, is very, very dangerous. 
Um, the GABA receptor agonists, we talked about those. When you gotta use a sleep med, those are probably some of the better, especially for the short term. They hit quick, they go away quick, and they don't leave a lot of side effects. They don't give you a hangover. But again, we try to use them on a very limited basis while we're trying to figure out what's really going on with someone's sleep. Uh, Benadryl, it's funny, if, if you go down the sleep aisle and you pick up, oh, I'm gonna get a sleep, sleep aid, I'm gonna take it home. Oh, wait, you know, allergies really bother me, so I'm gonna go down the allergy aisle and get some allergy medicine. And you take them home and you go, dang, that's the same stuff. Because it is, it's Benadryl. Histamine is a, is a awake chemical in our brain. Histamine is a learning chemical, it keeps us awake. Antihistamines, right? So you're essentially knocking that down. Not really good sleep medicines, they have a lot of hangover effects, and especially in the elderly. The elderly are very, very sensitive to the adverse effects, at least to confusion and falls and all sorts of stuff. I had a lady bring her um, older mother in to see me. I think mom was probably late 80s, and she was hallucinating. She said, Mom's hallucinating. We know what's going on with her. And you know, we went through all these tests and tried to figure all this stuff out. And honestly, I, I can't take credit for figuring out. And about the third office is after we run a bunch of tests trying to figure out what's going on with this poor woman. She comes in with this jug of Kirkland Benadryl, and mom had just been taking handfuls every night to sleep. And the good news was we took the Benadryl away and she was back to her old happy self. Older antidepressants, they tend not to work that well. They tend to be a little safer though. And there's a direct correlation between how safe things are and how well they work, which is really unfortunate. Um, antipsychotics, Seroquel, very rarely go there. Herbal remedies, does melatonin work? I get that a lot. Yes. Exactly. So if you look at the science, it doesn't really work that well. But if you talk to patients, say, hey, I take three milligrams of melatonin, I fall asleep like a log. It's like, sure, super, do it. One of the issues with melatonin, you know, it is a very important neurochemical in our brains, but one of the issues is the stuff we ingest has a hard time actually getting into the brain. Melatonin is a very important um, sleep regulator, and again, we don't want to turn it off with blue screens. And if melatonin's working for you, keep doing it. Um, Belsamra, brand new drug, they had a lot of ads on TV. Very interesting approach. Every single other med on here hits sleep receptors in the brain, one way or another, they're sedating. This stuff actually turns off the wake switch. So if you turn off wake, then sleep should just happen, right? Because wake's getting in the way of sleep. Makes a lot of sense. Um, I've had a handful of patients, we've tried it. I haven't really seen a lot of, a lot of good results. Um, Estrogen, uh, you know, estrogen is kind of the on again, off again thing. You know, 40 years ago, every woman had to be on estrogen, right? Because it's the fountain of youth. And then this Women's Health Initiative came out, so, you know, it's dangerous. And then every woman got off estrogen, and hot flashes, insomnia. So for some women, hormone replacement is actually very effective and works well. I never do this without talking with their gynecologist, their primary care physician, because there's, you know, there's, there's some women who shouldn't have it. But it does work for certain women. And of course, we talked about alcohol. Should we do that? Yes or no? Staying awake, I love this. So this is it. This, this is kind of, the, kind of the summary of the whole thing. You gotta evaluate a patient, be sure there's not a primary sleep disorder going on. And that's sometimes a little tricky. It's not obvious a lot of times. Medical problems and interfere with sleep, sleep hygiene with three exclamation points, super, super, super important. Regular exercise, all the bad stuff. I mean, all this stuff makes sense. And at the very bottom, then we start looking at sleep meds and other pharmacologic intervention. We'll take questions about insomnia in a little while. <laughs> Sleep apnea, yeah, super common. This, this woman, she's a great referral source. I have a lot of those. Mm -hmm. Referred by wife, yes. <laughs> Why wife? It's two times as common in men than women. Again, having to do with different um, anatomic, uh, where men put fat versus women put fat, what testosterone does to our airways, et cetera, et cetera. But it's really common, it's really dangerous, it's really easy recognized, and it's treatable. These are the classic symptoms. Oh my God, he snores so loud the paint comes off the walls. It's crazy. <laughs> Very common. I have husband and wife sleeping in different rooms because of this. Like, you know, I just can't do it. What's fun for me is if I fix this, I often treat two patients with one intervention. I fixed her problem as his problem. Daytime sleepiness, it varies. Some people are just like horribly tired. They can't stay awake for anything. Other people, it's like, you know, I just kind of fade out. You know, I'm watching TV. I tend to fall asleep. We think that's normal. I'm reading a book. That's normal. It's not normal. You shouldn't really have to fall asleep during the day if you're getting a good night's sleep at night. Headache and dry mouth in the morning. Headache comes from low oxygen levels. Every time you quit breathing, your oxygen level plummets, and then it pops back up. We can hold our breath much, much longer in sleep than we can during wake. The brain likes oxygen. It's unhappy when it doesn't get it. 
dry mouth from the snoring, moodiness. A lot of patients I'll see with untreated sleep apnea, they come in on antidepressants. Why? Because they're depressed. Yeah, I'm unmotivated. I want to do anything. I'm tired. I'm grumpy. I feel terrible. You fix the sleep problem, a lot of times those antidepressants go away. The symptoms are very, very similar. Memory problems, can't focus, can't concentrate. Sure. How many of you had a like horrible night's sleep and then wake up and just feel super sharp and able to do like complex math in your head, right? Doesn't happen. And then of course accidents. I, in true story, I've had two patients come to my office wrapped up from car crashes. Like, okay, I've heard about this for years. Okay, it's finally time to get it done. I rolled my car. Yeah. Um, they, did, they did a study in, uh, in Michigan. Um, I think it's just because there's a lot, a lot bigger guys there. And they, they did it in truck drivers. And they just got all these truck drivers. They were going through the scales. Hey, you want to sign up for this study? You know, we'll give you a free cheeseburger or whatever. And they did sleep studies. These guys, they didn't interview them. They didn't, they didn't get histories on their sleepiness, anything. They said, we're just going to take all these truck drivers and do sleep studies. Almost half of them had sleep apnea. Half of them. Now, mind you, it was a little weighted because, you know, they did it where there's a lot of cheese and maybe a lot bigger guys and maybe a higher prevalence. But still, all those trucks out there and half those guys have sleep apnea? Yeah, it's really scary. 22 million Americans, this is an estimate. And if any of your scientists out there, maybe some of you are, you say, well, if 80% of them are undiagnosed, then how do you know that 80% of them are undiagnosed? Because they're not diagnosed, right? The point is, it's very, very prevalent. It's as prevalent as asthma. I mean, who knows people with asthma? Virtually everybody, right? It's the same prevalence. It's very, very common. Why does it happen? Well, you know, back in the old days when we had slides and screens, I had a laser and I could point at stuff. And so I have to walk up here. So normal airway. So that's your nose, your mouth, your tongue, that's your soft palate, your uvula, and then the air just goes right down there. What happens in sleep apnea? All this stuff drops back. So when this guy's flopping around, that's flopping around, that creates the snoring. But when you get in deeper sleep, REM sleep, we talked about losing muscle tone. You lose muscle tone in REM sleep, it collapses, airway closes off. Now the airway's closed, now the oxygen levels are dropping, the brain's like, I really want to sleep, but I really want to breathe. And after a while, the body will tolerate longer and longer and longer breath holds. You'll see oxygen saturations go down to levels that you're surprised people can survive. And then what happens? You wake up. You don't remember these wake-ups. I don't wake up 12 times a night. Actually, yeah, you do, Bob. What happens is these wake-ups are five or 10 seconds, reinitiates muscle tone, airway opens, and this can go over and over and over. There's a metric we look at in sleep apnea, it's called the AHI, which is essentially the average number of times per night, or per hour rather, while you're asleep, you quit breathing. Believe it or not, normal's up to five. Kind of sounds like a lot, right? Normal healthy people can quit breathing while they're asleep five times an hour. But normal is five. There's some debate about that, and I'll leave it to the scientists to figure out. Um, I see patients, that number's 50, 60, 70, sometimes over 100. It's phenomenal. It's like, how did you wake up this morning? It's crazy. And it's really, you know, I think if you look at that, you can really understand the consequences, right? I mean, highly disrupted sleep, horrible drops in, in oxygen levels, and leaves all these terrible things. I mean, probably the worst on there is impotence and, and maybe, maybe heart attack. I'm not sure which is worse. But um, <laughs> and again, dementia, memory loss, um, pulmonary hypertension, stroke. A lot of these are the same things we saw in that first slide about the importance of sleep. But it's exacerbated because we have physiologic consequences. There's physiologic consequence to that recurrent adrenaline surge, adrenaline surge, the oxygen levels dropping. When I talk to my patients during the daytime, imagine you're just sitting there. And all day long, you're going to hold your breath as long as you can. And then as soon as you catch your breath, you're going to hold your breath again. And then you're going to do that eight hours a day, every day, for years and decades. That's why all this stuff happens. How we diagnose sleep apnea? Well, actually, I'll, I'll digress a minute. I'll tell you kind of a sad and scary story. You know, we've, we've often thought or kind of deducted that sleep apnea probably kills people. People probably get to a point in their lives and in their sleep where you know, the brain just says, hey man, if, if you're not going to breathe, I'm not going to beat, and, and it's over. Um, and, and it's hard to prove because, you know, it's, it's really, it's a good murder weapon. It leaves no trace, right? You find, oh, and Bob died in his sleep, and we don't know why, and it must have been a heart attack. That's what they always say. But we, we can't see that sleep apnea killed somebody. And, and I, I was unfortunate enough to have to review a case one time from a sleep lab where this man with very bad sleep apnea was there, and look at all the graphs, and you see, oh, he stopped breathing, oh, his heart rate's dropping, oh, his Oxygen's dropping, heart rate's dropping, oxygen's dropping, and then boom, nothing, flat line. What do we do? We all have our blinders on, right? Nobody dies in sleep lab. I mean, I, I, I've never talked to a sleep tech that saw somebody die in a sleep lab, right? So he didn't even think of that. So he's 
adjusting gains and filters and you know, you know, trying to figure out what's wrong with the equipment. Five minutes go by, he's all, oh. Yeah, so we saw it real time, it does happen. And that's why I'm always on patients. I feel fine, I don't need to treat this. You actually you really do. So when we're doing sleep studies, there's two ways of doing it. This is actually our sleep lab over at Barton. It's like right across the street. Um, I have to brag a little bit. We just got certified by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. Um, very, very arduous and long process. Killed a whole bunch of trees, all the paperwork. We had a site visit um, and actually just, was it this month? I think it was this month we finally got our certification. So we're certified by them. We're up to their um, standards and credentials and it's, it's not a small task. Our, uh, our uh, director, Mary Kay Sennings, did a phenomenal job getting us there, and we're all, we're all pretty proud of that. And by the way, we also did a little remodel and got all new stuff in there, so it's, it's, it's not bad. It's not bad. There's another way of doing it, though. For folks that, you know, it's like, oh, I don't got to spend a night in a sleep lab, and it's expensive, and there's all those wires. If people are just, you know, medically uncomplicated, they don't have heart failure, they don't have COPD, they don't have seizures, they're not on supplemental oxygen, this is actually a pretty good technology. It's come a long way. Um, years ago, the, the home sleep studies were pretty wonky, and we're like, eh, okay, maybe. Um, this is actually a really good device. It measures sleep stages, it can determine when you're in REM, it checks heart rates, it can look at oxygen levels. And for people that are uncomplicated with a high suspicion of sleep apnea, like, yeah, I'm pretty sure you got this, this is actually a really nice way to do it. You come in, you get hooked up, you take this thing home, you wear it for two nights, you bring it back, and most of the time will give us the data. If there's something suspect or, <clears throat> excuse me, not making sense with what we thought was going on, then we can send you to the sleep lab. Or, you know, sometimes people have difficulty using it. But it's, it's a really nice option, and it's really helped us screen a lot more patients. How do we treat sleep apnea? In the old days, 20 plus years ago, we did a lot of surgery for sleep apnea. Going, well, just you know, make the hole bigger, you know, cut out the tonsils and the uvula and the soft palate. And they used to do these medieval things where they'd literally take the tongue, slice it down the middle, take out a wedge, sew it all back together, because we're going to make the hole bigger, right? Make the hole bigger and life is good. Well, unfortunately, we found that didn't work very well, and surprisingly, patients didn't really like it very much. <laughs> so, I know. But, uh, it's still an option for very select patients. I send maybe one patient every year or two for surgery. This is really the gold standard, and the way it works is pretty straightforward. Mask, air pressure, blows in the airway. That air, that air acts as a pneumatic splint. It keeps the airway from collapsing. It, and the metaphor I use all the time is imagine you had a plastic bag. It's collapsed on itself. You blow into the plastic bag. As long as you blow in the plastic bag, it stays open. As soon as you quit blowing, it collapses. CPAP does the same thing. That air pressure keeps your airway open, keeps it from collapsing, air goes in and out, and life is really good. CPAP has a really bad name, and people, I mentioned it to them, they, they just, they turn, they run, they say, no, never, and, and the wives usually tacking their husbands in the hall, say, no, come back. Oh, maybe that's why, yeah. Internet's fun, isn't it? You can find anything you want on the internet. So, and, and you know, truly, this, that was some of the old masks. They were big, they were bulky, they're uncomfortable. And yeah, if the patient's laying flat on their back and not moving, this might work. But you know, we all lay on our sides, we roll around, we you know, adjust pillows. Um, and this was one of the biggest challenges we had in getting CPAP to work was the mask. I tell patients 90% of making CPAP work is finding the right mask. And thankfully tonight we have a couple vendors in the back who are gonna show you some of the newer stuff. It's really, really changed change the whole treatment algorithm for sleep apnea. Because the newer ones, no preference, I'm not, I'm not playing favorites, all right? But um, th this is one of the newer masks. It just goes under the nose, the tube attaches at the top of the head, and you can see the machines are very, very small. And they have some other new features as well. This is kind of a cool thing. There's an app for that, right? <laughs> so all these machines nowadays, they have Bluetooth in them. And so they'll send a report every morning to your phone. How well did you do? How long did you sleep? How many times did you quit breathing? How well did your mask fit? And when it first came out, I don't know about other sleep doctors, they eh, whatever, it's a gimmick, who cares? Another thing to stare at on your phone. But it, it turns out that when people have this, their average usage of CPAP goes up by about an hour a night, which is huge because we've tried all sorts of other interventions over the years, like, oh yeah, 15 minutes, we're doing good. This is really a good thing because I think when people are involved in their care and they're part of the process, they're much more into the, into, the, into the process and making it work. Next to it is, a, again, not playing favorites, um, they make very small CPAP machines. Oh, you know, I camp, I travel, I want to 
haul this big machine around. Well, first off, they're not that big, but some of the newer ones will literally fit in the palm of your hand. They don't have a lot of the features of, of the, you know, the, the bedside units, but there's a lot of innovation going on, and that's kind of the point of all this. There's a lot of innovation going on to make this patient friendly, to make it work for them. And I spend a lot of time with my CPAP patients addressing problems. I see them two weeks after we start, and they say, hey, what's working and what's not? Because most of those problems, most of those nuisances, as long as they're motivated, we can fix them. And then they get to that happy place where it changes their life. And um, it's really, really important just not to give somebody CPAP machine, which sometimes happens elsewhere. Here's your machine, see you next year. That does not work. You know, the, the first step to failure with this is frustration. So I work really, really hard not to let my patients get frustrated with this. Are there other things? Well, yeah, there are. And these things have come a long way as well. These are, go by many names, oral appliance, dental appliance, mandibular advancement device. But functionally what they're doing, they're two-part mouthpieces. The upper part is the anchor for the lower part. The lower part has some type of mechanism, there's lots of different designs, to bring the jaw forward. All right, so you use the upper jaw to leverage the lower jaw forward. As the jaw goes forward, the tongue's attached to the jaw, so the tongue goes forward. You open up the space. And this can actually be very effective for certain patients. You have to kind of select carefully. This is really nice. It's in a box this big, you can take it anywhere. By the way, these patients quit snoring with these as well. And it's actually a really good option for a lot of our patients. This is what, and again, there's, you can go online, there's like a hundred different designs out there, but they all functionally do the same thing. This one, upper teeth, and there's this band mechanism that pulls the jaw forward. You want these done by somebody who really knows what they're doing. Um, no disrespect to dentists, but every dentist, oh, I can make you one of those. You want to have somebody who makes a lot of them, who really knows what they're doing. It's a fine art. Um, if you make them wrong, you don't fix the sleep apnea. If you make them wrong, they're too tight, the jaw goes forward, they get TMJ, their jaw hurts, and they say, screw it. And these things are expensive, they're really expensive, so you want to get it done right. <clears throat> and that's it, see, she's sleeping, he's, he's not snoring, life is good. So this is John Weston Harding, this is another quote, this is, I guess he was a mean gunslinger back in the day, he says, they tell lots of lies about me. They say I killed six or seven men for snoring. Well, it ain't true, I only killed one man for snoring. <laughs> And, th and there you all are. <laughs> <laughs>